Hey guys, and welcome to my presentation. I'm Martin Gunnison, and I'm a freelance rigging TD. And today we're gonna go through some of the confessions being in this profession. So let's jump right into it. Today we're gonna talk about why I became a rigger and what's the process for choosing that as a profession. The second part is more of a back to basic. If you don't have too much understanding about this subject, I'm gonna go through a few uh, concepts and ideas that might be able to give you a better understanding. And then I'm gonna move on to some confession and some war stories. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about some of the things I learned and things that I wish that people would have told me in an earlier position, because they're quite useful. So let's go back to who am I? I'm originally from Sweden, but I currently live in Portugal with my wife and I have a son that is close to two years old very soon. And I always had this passion for creating digital art. So I started exploring 3D in um, high school uh, and then after college, I went into 3D education that then further down the line led me into an internship back in uh, London. So a few people online might know me by my other name, which is Dear Stranger. And I'm not gonna go too much into the reason why this particular name was chosen, but I do like puns. So it has to do with my name though. That's because you would think that Martin Gunnison is quite unique, but if you do a Google search, you'll see that that's actually not the case. There's quite a few of us. And down there at the bottom, yep, that is me. Fifth place, nice. And it's not even my website, it's actually a YouTube link. Huh. And funny thing, when I worked for a company in Toronto, they actually thought that they had hired this guy as they only met me through emails and like pixelated Zoom calls. So yeah, I mean, we're both Swedes though. So I'm sure they didn't got too disappointed. So, so far in my career, I've been fortunate enough to work with this four companies. And some of them were more focused on animation uh, and other ones more on like commercials, um, places like Framestore did more film. Uh, and VFX and yeah like mainframe where I started were more on the animation side and it was actually good to do a lot of like commercials I think in the beginning because it gave me short timelines where you needed to do a project under not too much of uh, time in a way to explore different ideas so for the last three years I have been uh, freelancing though and uh, this was quite a big step for me because to go from this comforting of having the studios and a day-to-day -day, uh, paycheck to be able to find the work yourself, that's quite a, um, a big thing. But it's a good, scary step, I think, that I definitely recommend everyone that if you, if you do have the courage and um, the portfolio, then you should be able to, to make it as well. Because there's a lot of work out there and there's a lot of learning by doing. Uh, and the fact that when you work with different studios, you find out so much about the different pipelines, different people, different personalities, and way of doing stuff. So it's a way to like kickstart your career, at least for me in many ways. But before going further, I think it's time to show my showreel to give you a little insight into the work that I've done so far, both from a full-time position and freelance.
All right. So next step up, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey into being a, specifically a rigger. So when I started at Mainframe, I was kind of like a generalist. Um, and I did pretty much everything like lighting, animation, texturing, comping, you name it. Shots like the one you see in the background here is something that I put together all the elements for it. And that was a good way to start learning about the pipeline and to find out really what I wanted to do uh, by doing all of these things. Because you kind of need to try it before you kind of get a taste for it, I would say. But then I started to think, how can I push my work forward? And I came to the conclusion that I wanted to focus more on some specific areas. So I started to explore more technical tasks, stuff like Aincloth simulations, learning real flow, uh, is some of the things that I wanted to look more into and went more into the problem solving route. Uh, but for me, this didn't seem to be the right path as I never find enough pleasure in waiting for the simulations that took like two hours to get it out. And then it didn't look correct in the end either way. Maybe nowadays with Houdini, this would be quite different, I guess. So it was technical for sure, but I missed some opportunities for some creative outlets that I didn't feel like I got. So that's when I started to explore more about the rigging. And I would say that this is where my real passion come in because when I started to dig a bit deeper into the subject, I kind of fell in love with the power of these digital puppets and the fact that you would get a model and then it's really up to me and my imagination and how much time the client have to bring this character to life. I also felt there was a direct correlation between the time that I spent on it and kind of the output of the, the work that I got out of that effort. Well, one might still ask, why particular rigging? Because there's so many areas to choose from. You have like lighting, modeling, texturing, animation, crowd, there's other things that is still like on a technical level, but also artistic. But the thing I like about this is because it's a crossway between the art and the problem solving in creating these shapes that get a sense of motion from a static model, right? And to building these digital puppets that performs in the computer is kind of similar to building it for real in a way. At least the goal is to make it feel as real as possible. And that way you can make it come alive. It's also about recreating a concept with this puppet that is really rewarding. And to get the model and then you have the concept drawings from the art department. And it's about pushing the process, especially in this kind of cartoonish work where you normally with a real life uh, actor or character wouldn't be able to push it to the same limit without things breaking. It's also about helping the animators to create the best performance. Because in the end, if I have done a good job, most of my work will hopefully be invisible. I happy I kind of got to talk about this because normally nobody thinks too much about the rigor, right? Everyone wants to be an animator superstar because they're the one creating the action and everything moving. But without the rigors, there wouldn't be too much rigs to animate. It's also about finding clever solutions to situations that the animator might not have thought about or they would do it one particular way. But you know that there is a better solution for it and you would propose those solutions and have some really happy animators that can focus on other things. Sometimes it's not so pretty though. And this kind of things can leave you with a few nightmares. Although, you always get time to do the rigging dance. And before we move further, let's discuss some of the basics. And if you're not sure what we're talking about here, I'm gonna break it down into a few concepts that you might be able to get easier. One part about my job is articulations and bones. Because if you think back about the stop motion animation industry, they have these handmade puppets, right? They need a skeleton inside. And a big reason for it is to have this really reliable motions because you need to be able to put the puppet in place and then it needs to stay there. 
and if you would just have it by clay, it wouldn't really hold up a shape very well. And it's the same in 3D, but we're working with the sticky top puppets. But you still need a structure underneath that's driving everything. It's just not made out of metal, but of matrix and math. The second part is about anatomy. And this is taking it one step further. So when we have our skeleton, there's also other layers on top. And this is how we maintain the volume. And where does things bend from? This stuff is really important. And anatomy might not be something that you think about too much in the beginning when you start rigging. It is definitely more important down the line because things like where you place your clavicle, if it is a few inches off, all of the rotation from the arm is going to suffer from it. But you're not going to really see that until you look at the skeletal drawings and see where all of the articulation points are happening. The third part is about control or controllers, one might say. Since the animator is your client, they want to work with as little friction as possible because they really just care about the expressions that they're able to get and don't want to think too much about all of the controllers. And that's why I like to do things like color coding, where you can see here that the main controllers for the center of the volume is uh, yellow, and then you have the left side in blue and the right side in, in red. And it's time for some confessions. Let's get into the dirty stuff. Things that I'd rather not talk too much about, but since it's the team of the conference, let's bring it on. So the first one, fake it until you make it. So some of you might know about Digital Tutors. It's an online community that have different courses about pretty much everything nowadays. I think nowadays they're called Pluralsight, by the way, or they got bored of them, I'm not entirely sure. And this is where I learned a lot about rigging in the beginning and the concepts that made up a basic rig. They had this course, for example, on rigging up um, a cartoonish character. Uh, and this course is what I used for rigs in the beginning. So I kind of just followed along, had this playing on the other screen as I was rigging. And it was a lot painting by numbers, just following exactly what they were doing and seeing the result and if something went wrong you needed to go back and see whatever you missed from the first place. I didn't focus too much on the principles but it was more like I said just following along and doing exactly as they did. It's not a great way to learn but I think doing this over and over again it just got me a grasp of the, the main concepts and that way I was able to take it on from there. It's funny though because on my showreel when I started my internship I had a few rigs on there and one of the guys I spoke to there, he's actually a rigger as well. And he mentioned, oh, those elbow controllers, they look quite familiar. Is that digital tutors? And yeah, I needed to admit that that was actually the case. Another thing with making rigs in this kind of matter was that it was incredibly slow to do stuff. And I just wanted to show you a few examples here. This wasn't necessarily made by a tutorial, but it's just the way that I was doing it. Uh, I had this like six butterflies in different scenarios. Uh, and this six butterflies for me, I think it took around like three weeks to do it because it had dynamics on the wings and this wings, it was like four for each butterfly. And I couldn't really copy and paste it because it was different proportions. It was a mess. One ant for this commercial for Harrods. Around a week, I think. I did this project for Gift Lab, which I think had around three characters. Um, and yeah, I think it took like four weeks or something, creating all of those expressions and everything. So nowadays, the way that I approach it, which makes way more sense, is to be more efficient in the way that I do stuff. Uh, because if you think about it, the characters is always going to have their arms and always going to have a leg and a, and a face. So if you can find procedures that are common in between them, solve them once. You know that you kind of have it and then you can move your problem solving over to other areas. And this also comes down to scripting the rigs rather than building them by hand, but we're going to get more about that later. So this means that I could apply it to all of the characters at the same time rather than building one by one. So now I want to continue on with the last part. And that's what I call the core principles. And this is focusing on things that I learned and things that I think that other people might benefit from as well. Always use references. 
And this applies to pretty much every part of the pipeline, I think. But it's very important to stay true to what you are referencing if you're working on something specific. It's easy to get stuck in front of the computer when you're making things in 3D, uh, trying to solve it in there. But many times you should really look into the real world for your inspiration. And you can just ask the sculptor that made a statue of Ronaldo. He probably should have spent a little bit more time on his references. At least he had another go at it with a more lifelike result. This is a project I worked with Analog, uh, creating a commercial for Audi that included this photorealistic eye. And, and I had videos of myself, I have videos of my colleagues. And I was looking into ways that we were blinking, the different eye darts that you would have left to right, all of the small dilations in the pupil that you might not notice otherwise, that is hard to pick up. That's what we captured on camera. And this was a good source of just trying to match the reference as much as possible. Even if it was done by hand, it had a realistic motion that then carried on into the animation. And I'm gonna show you here the final animation to see how everything comes together. Another project I worked on was for Honda, and they had this commercial that was taking place in the desert. We needed some photorealistic cars they needed to drive on it, also the way that the suspension system works inside of the cars, and this was something that I hadn't really explored too much up to this point, because I was more focused on the characters, but this was really fun to understand how the suspension system etc works, and getting like that right traction when you went through the sand, leaving like trails. We also had the Asimo robot running around, as you can see on the bottom. Uh, and fun about this guy, because the other part of this presentation was this Asimo robot that you might have seen on different tech channels. And he is normally as walking around very slowly and methodically. But here they wanted him to be running. And there was just one single reference of it online that we had him running for around 50 frames or something. So I just took that in a loop and try to create a little run cycle, which looks hilarious. And in the final spot, I think they had him go even faster because it was just too slow to go across the screen. And here's the final piece for that commercial. And it's pretty fast, so don't blink. This other project, um, working hands on, as you can see. Nah, I'm just kidding. It's just about hands, uh, different hand research. A lot of the animations that you see here is also done with the Leap Motion controller. So it's, it's actually mocapped, a lot of it. And it was fun to explore how the different tendons move across the bones and stuff like the compression when you're hitting a surface with your finger. How does that look and how, how could you make that in a realistic way. It was just a fun little research project. So if you want to take one thing away from this presentation, I'll say that it's probably this. Learn to code. So my first ever tool was this little to-do manager. I think it was like 400 lines of code in Python, something like that. And it was less about the result, I would say, and more about the process and for me to actually getting into coding 
uh, and learning Python through this little project that I had. Also, apparently, life was way easier back then for the steps you need to take for a project. So nowadays, I kind of live in my tools daily, and this is where I do a lot of my work. And it didn't happen overnight. Like, this kind of stuff takes time. It takes ages to partly, like, building systems that you're happy with, learning how you want to do it. And on top of that, you need to be able to know how to rig in the first place. So you shouldn't expect yourself to know all of this. But slowly and steady, it's worth to hammer it out because the reward of it is very big in the end of the day. Because it means that all of the problems that you're encountering, you can learn from them. And many times you only need to do it once. And this is still inside of Maya, you know? But I'm the one controller to rig, rather than dealing with this kind of stuff. Well, it's still happening underneath the rig. You might just not see it. So the other thing I want to talk about is the importance of asking for help. Especially if you're getting stuck. So when I was working at Framestore in London, I had the opportunity to work with so many talented riggers there. I think we were like 30 of us at a time. To be honest, this left me with quite an imposter syndrome, I must say. At my past companies, I had been the only rigger doing it my way. And then I come here with all of these people being super badass at what they're doing. And you feel kind of small. But the thing is, there were so many helpful people there that just wanted to make my experience more enjoyable. And I think I learned so much more by talking with them about my problems rather than trying to like solve them on my own. So when I tell people that I make tools, they normally ask me, how do I come up with the things that I, that I do? So the thing is, I find things that is annoying in my workflow. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to write it down into every like repeatable task. And then hopefully you will end up with some type of patterns to see, oh, I should probably focus more on this or I should focus more on this pipeline stuff. And then I would implement that into tools for myself. And the thing is, if I have use for it, there's probably a good chance that other people would as well. And that's why, for example, I have released this tool called Cosmos and it's all available for the community. And if you're not familiar, it is a tool for searching all of the different stuff in Maya. And you can also add your own scripts and like code snippets and stuff like that. And the thing is, when I start with a new company, I normally bring over Cosmos, install that, and 90% of my setup is ready there. And then I just link it to my online cloud system. And uh, there I have it. Let me not talk too much about this. And let me instead show you the fancy promotion video that I put out for the latest update. <laughs> So the last part of this presentation comes to challenging yourself. And one aspect is about knowing not only what you do right now and what you work with, in my case rigging, but also the things around you. So as a rigger, it's good for me to know a little bit about modeling and a little bit about animation. And I can focus more on this than I would do, for example, with lighting and composting. And that's why, for example, it's good for you to know about modeling, because that way you can get back to them when you have any feedback. Or the animation, which is the client, to know what they want from their side. And this kind of stuff comes into fruition for the projects like this, which is for Nike. And they had these shoes they needed to animate into different objects. And we tried a classic rigging approach for this, but it just didn't work because we needed to update it all the time and encounter like new scenarios as you went along. And it was actually easier for me to just rig it and animate it as we went along because it was quite fluid in the process of how it was done and not entirely clear how you go from one object to the other one. Another project where I had this push into animation-based rigging was with my wife. So we worked on this project for the Australian Chamber Orchestra and it was quite an open brief where they wanted to bring motion to this song that they had. So it was a fun exploration of like trying to portray the sense of motion from music 
and how that would work through space. So I think I'm just going to show you the, um, the behind the scene video. And yeah, this is pretty much a mix of me and her's work where I was focusing on the animation and some of the uh, R&D setup and she was doing some modeling, lighting and texturing and like making sure that everything had a really nice finish. And the last note here is about not getting stuck in one single application. So recently I've been exploring more about this interactive pieces uh, and digging more into Unreal. This project here, for example, you see is for MLF in UK, where I worked on bringing to life characters for an online screenplay of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night Dream. And I had a lot of fun like translating what I do day to day in Maya into this other context of Unreal. It was also a blast to work with this motion capture performances and to have them performing in real time on the rigs that you were making. And I feel like as a final takeaway the, um, that learning principles rather than tools is so much more useful for you, especially down your career, because everything keeps on updating and whatever you have today is going to look very different tomorrow or five years or 10 years from now. Thank you very much for listening to me today. And if you have any questions, stick around afterwards. And I think we have a Q and A. And if you'd like to follow me, you have my social links here. And um, thank you very much. I'm going to start off with the, with one of my questions. The, the, one of the questions I'm I'm always asking uh, our um, uh, speakers is, what would you consider to be your cardinal sin? Like the, the sin that you, if you if if you were the if you had the opportunity to, you know, get rid of one of your sins, which one would it be? What would you <laughs> think is? Uh, so. I'm not entirely familiar with um, with uh, like seven, seven deadly sins, but I'm looking here and I can definitely see that um, like gluttony probably is okay. my side because <laughs> as a, as a Swede, yeah. I love my sweets and like uh, licorice and stuff like that. So okay. I think if um, if uh, anything, it would that would be the one that I would probably try to confess get to oh, okay. the first. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for your talk on rigging. It, it's it, also, for me, always something very, um, very new and, 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 and something that I find 
very interesting but always feels like a very technical thing and I think um, one, one of the questions I always um, ask myself is how do you like how involved are you in the creative process in terms of do you get feedback from the animators a lot is there are you um, is the problem solving kind of done at some point and then basically the, the, the animators need to deal with what there is or is it a back and forth kind of situation? I definitely say that there's a back and forth process because mm -hmm. you, if you're lucky, you're there from a very early stage where even when you're kind of designing the characters, you would kind of bring up the, the challenges that you might see mm -hmm. with different types of proportions or different like uh, uh, mechanics for the, for the rigs on how it's designed. Uh, but then even after the model is delivered and then you... Um, you have rigged it up, give it into animators. There is definitely like a back and forth of um, how to use the rig, right? And um, mm -hmm. if this find something is more or less easy to use. Um, and I always like try to give myself the time, if I can afford it, to deliver the rig a little bit earlier, just so I'm able to work with the animator back and forth to, mm -hmm. to have that kind of like feedback cycle running. Okay, so you're always in the loop with, um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing at some point, Sometimes maybe something comes up where, where, where the animators are just stuck because the rig does not provide what they need yeah, for a certain situations. I think, I think like sometimes it goes between like not having a clear brief maybe of what the rig need to do from the very beginning. Okay. And that way where the animator comes in and they like, oh, we need, we need the rig to perform this type of specific tasks mm -hmm. uh, that it might not have been made for in, mm -hmm. the, in the first stage. Uh, I think that's probably the normal like reasons why okay. it's kind of heading back into to regular okay. just to like perform in, in like there might be more uh, facial animation that you are expecting so they need more controllers for the for the face and uh, mm -hmm. like that area okay and and do you usually um so so if you get hired is that something you kind of calculate or or is there um a certain amount of time that you are available for you know redos and feedback and stuff like that or is it because it feels like okay there's here's, here's a four-week period this is when you need to deliver the rig and then do you usually plan on having a, I don't know a week or two for troubleshooting or is it is it usually done after four weeks and then you just basically this stop it depends like from studio to studio and which companies you work with because if you're lucky they, they do have like um like a building period like you say like an overlap and many times it's like a couple of days at least just to be able to like give it to the animator they can say this part sucks this one is really good and then you can go from there mm -hmm. um but it's something I, I try to ask for otherwise especially on like freelance gigs that okay. run pretty pretty fast yeah um yeah it, it's, it's important for sure as they are I was um, talking about it like they are your clients, the animators. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to provide them with the best possible rig. Okay. Um, okay. So here's another question. Uh, what software do you use? You mentioned uh, that with Houdini, um, uh, a past project would have been easier. Um, do you now use Houdini? Um, I don't use Houdini as of now. Um, okay. I think the, the Houdini part was more in the simulation oh. factor. Mm -hmm. uh, my day-to-day my day -day work is happening in Maya, Autodesk Maya. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where I'm spending most of my day, if it's not like in the scripting editors and coding. Um, before that, I was I was actually starting in the industry with Free to the Max mm -hmm. uh, and then moving up the Autodesk train, I guess. Uh, but it's, a lot of like interesting stuff happening in Houdini in terms of the rigging part that I'm kind of playing with in the background, but I haven't really been able to apply. I'm kind of in between um, Houdini and Blender right okay. now as to like being contestant to possibly like be able to provide rigs for it. But right now, the big reason why I'm staying in my because that's where the animators are. Okay. So um, that's why I'm I'm kind of keeping my my efforts at the moment. Okay. Uh, here's another question from MGO. Uh, hey Martin, how long did it take you to translate your characters and rigs into Unreal? I am generally mm. not afraid of new stuff, but Unreal is 
so huge with so many opportunities to get lost? There's a lot of opportunities for sure. And I actually only like touch the surface of what you can really do for it. Mm -hmm. So I've been dabbling with the control rig sections, which is part of their like, um, not just having bones that you animate in other applications and bring in, but in this case, you're actually rigging inside of Unreal then. Um, and I'm not sure in terms of a specific time frame that it took, but I think it's more like understanding the, like thinking outside of your, oh, this, t I, when I rig, I do this with the specific tools in this specific order mm -hmm. and more like grasping the concepts because a lot of it in my head at least came down to like um, the math part and being able to like think, oh, from a, from a lower, lower like perspective, Mm -hmm. This is how I need to do to be able to get the arm rig to, to work in a specific way. Or um, for this project that we had with um, the Dreams, uh, one of the last ones I showed, where we had like mocap animation. We had, for example, then a character that needed to drive like a wing on the back. Mm -hmm. So we just find out like how to be able to hook it up with, um, with the right um, controllers. And then it was just off from there. And yeah, like a lot of it is just like learning on the job. Okay. Um, a lot, a lot of this stuff is new as well, mm -hmm. so it's not too much uh, documentation about it. Mm -hmm. Although a lot of this, like, is googling around and see, like, asking different people uh, for specific challenges you have. Mm -hmm. But if you have the opportunity and like want to learn more, it's it's a great way because you you can see everything in real time there, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's bringing in like a an interesting um, aspect that you normally like. Normally, like your rigs is performing fast, and hopefully they are as fast time, uh, real time as possible. Uh, but here, everything is like down to earth, like at least sixty FPS. So um, you're getting instant response. Okay. Um, there's a new one coming in. MGO, I hope that answered your question. I'm. Yeah, um, hopefully. Yeah. Um, someone is typing. So I'm waiting for the. Mm -hmm. um, I hope they don't um, decide out the way. <laughs> Where, yeah, this I, kind of talk. I, I'm sure. I'm hoping, yeah. I hope I'm not stressing anyone out with the typing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So MGO says thanks for the answer. Um, here's Gristoff. Um, in your reel, there's quite a lot of different styles of rigging, from deformers or and cartoony rubber hose, Rigsto the more realistic ones. Um, how do you adjust for the switch between projects if your headspace has the solution for one animation style and not the other? Um, That's a very good question. Very good question. OK. <laughs> um, I don't have a down, down to earth answer to it, really, other than you just need to change your gears. Like A lot of things can be applied over in the sense of like your characters Mm -hmm. But I've found to like specific details of um, one aspect of uh, VFX work and more like real photorealistic humans is the deformations and having it deform correctly. Mm -hmm. If you have a, have a rubber hose uh, character, you're kind of limited in terms of what you can do and like how the, the char how much geometry is the character have to deform as well. It can mm -hmm. be like a simple, simple uh, uh, spine. But for something like a, a shoulder rig for a realistic human, that's going to provide different type of challenges where you need to set up your, your uh, like rethink about your anatomy and make sure that you have your like clavicle points in the right position, making sure that all of your um, connection points are correct. Because otherwise, when you bend that arm, it's going to look really strange if your arm is starting from here mm -hmm. or if it's starting from here. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's like a, like a, um, one thing to to apply at least. And then, um, like I said, with references, making mm -hmm. sure that you check in references, because uh, one thing that my wife brought up when I, she looked at my presentation was the uh, like references for cartoons. Like, how do you get references for those kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. um, Any yeah, other, I, I guess looking at past work is one, one way, like mm -hmm. looking at um, stuff like the Looney Tunes, like all of those um, uh, old like, cartoons is a way to, um, see what's been done and many times like just trying to recreate it mm -hmm. but yeah there's it's, it's different different challenges for sure with those different types 
but it comes down to the same like underlying problem in a way. Uh, it's just like the way that you approach it. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Um, Christoph was kind of stressed in having to type so fast, but it's, <laughs> yes, it's uh, well done, Christoph. Okay. Uh, there's two more coming. Let's see who. Okay. Um, I have a quick in, in terms of references if you if so so if you talk about um, anatomy for example is there something you could recommend in terms of you know going to books or exhibitions or, or how, how do you approach anatomical um, or does drawing animation uh, ana anatomy help or is it, how, how do you approach um, a problem that you have with anatomy is it is it purely um, other rigging reference or is it is it traditional books or any kind of you know yeah in terms of like anatomy i don't have any particular source i probably should but normally i use like google for the different um, mm -hmm. parts and you can find a lot of like really good magic um, like um, like from hospitals, etc. Like okay. drawings of how things look inside. Like you have your muscles, you have your skeleton, mm -hmm. and you kind of see in proportion sometimes with uh, the whole body. Like this is where your anchor points supposed to be. Um, there is a good uh, book on the subject, which I'm gonna look for in the background. If I find it, I will I'll send the link in the um, okay in 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 the chat, uh, which is like sculpt uh, sculpting for um, for uh, modeling and 3D, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of good stuff in terms of like the um, thinking in terms of layers of the face and the, and the body mm -hmm. and the fact that you could like th think of it like like different volumes and they all like building up towards one single um, one single thing okay here's another question from Joshua Lena and um, most unusual rigs you did I with a question mark so I'm guessing that's um, a question for the most mm. unusual rig and then the nike ad uh, you did is really unique um have to wrap my yeah. head around that <laughs> <laughs> yes it took me a while to wrap my head around that as well yeah that that was a really fun project uh it, it, yeah it's such a such a different challenge than what i normally get in the sense of this is your this is your character and this is what it needs to do in this case, we had um, we had a shoe, and we had this like um, this uh, different sculptures that mm -hmm. kind of I think we had like a heart, you had like a lips, etc. From this um, really good designer, and um, then it was up to me really and, uh, and to come up with how they could transition in really fun ways. So um, he went through a lot of iterations, as figuring out like what what's interesting to look at. Because uh, it's one thing to go from like the easiest uh, mm -hmm. transitions in terms of a morph, but for it to to look appealing, like you had the lips like twisting around and being like a uh, like a cloth that you're turning. Mm -hmm. that, that was a good like use of different techniques that I learned throughout my career. Mm -hmm. Some like ink cloth, some like thinking in terms of like rigging layers where you would rig something up manually and then mm -hmm. you're applying dynamics on top of it as a way to create like a secondary motion. Mm -hmm. And then you can also sculpt on top of it as well. So um, all of those things adding up to uh, a result that hopefully looks like uh, you're not really sure what's going on <laughs> and what's happening. Okay. So probably that's the most unusual rig you ever did, right? Or I think uh, so. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I, I get a lot of weird requests. Um, but um, I think that's probably one of the ones. We had, uh, it's not really strange, but we had a Barbie ad that I worked on for okay. um, Carbon VFX. Mm -hmm. That was really fun, but they were very specific in terms of mm -hmm. how they wanted these Barbies to look and perform, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the in the face section, which is ironic because they don't really move. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but yeah, we had a, a lot of work just making sure that those look uh, atomically accurate to okay. how a Barbie would function. Um, you mentioned that that um, you, there's there's quite a bit of exchange in terms of um, between 
experts or between riggers. Um, is, is there anything you could recommend to people who are starting out and any kind of um, platform they could, they could look for advice or is there, um, do you guys meet up in person? Is there, how, how, how do you connect with, with other people that are interested in the field as it is, as you said, a little more narrow than maybe other fields like uh, like animation, animation or, or lighting or, or something. Yeah, something yeah. Like yeah, it is. It is quite specific. Um, over the years, uh, there's multiple like Slack forums that I've been um, invited to. Uh, one really good um, website is uh, techartist.org. Mm -hmm. Tech-artist.org. Um, that is um, a really good platform for people that if you have different um, problems with your rigs, or if you're looking for feedback, you mm -hmm. can post it on the air, there to get. Um, to get feedback. Um, there is a TD Anonymous that I um, have a talk with sometimes, a Slack mm -hmm. channel. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't see too many people in person, riggers. I'm always happy when I do. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> okay. it's, it feels like we're quite of a, a rare breed. Yeah. But I, I always encourage people to come to the dark side. Like yeah. it's all uh, nice and cozy here, I promise. Uh, except for all of the, the math stuff. But uh, yeah. No, it's it's good. Okay, so and yeah, like. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, no, I'm I was gonna... I was gonna say like if if you have any questions like, mm -hmm. feel like at any point like feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy even if you're like just starting out, mm -hmm. I'm happy to like look at your reel or if you want any like feedback or how to come into the industry whatever like mm -hmm. the door is always open. Okay, thank you, thank you for that um, kind offer. Um, I'm, I guess you, you're gonna maybe you can. Um, post some of the, the, the things you mentioned later on in the channel so yeah, people can do. look it up. And mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I have uh, another question. Uh, with all the advancements in automation in AI, what are your predictions for the future of breaking? Do you think we're all going to be out of jobs? In five years? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, don't know. Don't even it's... start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we can see it as a helpful tool because a lot of stuff it can um, it can help with, mm -hmm. and there's so much work happening nowadays in terms of AI models to like mm -hmm. take a face and it can recreate it in um, in a mesh and in a 3D. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the the works that we do manual now, like like CG doubles, mm -hmm. uh, like what you what I did for the frame store. Where you take a character and you need to recreate it for poses that they normally can't perform. Mm -hmm. A lot of that work, I think, is going to be applied um, with AI. Just to like, it's, it's inter always interesting to see like uh, the work that like really talented companies like ILM putting out of the mm -hmm. like Luke Skywalker in the mm -hmm. Mandalorian, etc. And then you have someone on a computer like running this AI program, mm -hmm. uh, old footage just uh, shooting it through mm -hmm. and getting. Uh, very similar, if sometimes yeah. not better, better result. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, using the using AI. So yeah, I think it's gonna disrupt our industry in many many ways that we we don't predict. Mm -hmm. But I hope that it will be more on the helpful side rather than the doomsday approach of taking all of our jobs. Okay. So uh, you mentioned math, and it's it 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 feels like a I don't know um, a mood killer to some degree. Um, for, 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 for a lot of people. Um, how, how do you, how would you um, describe your, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the, the minute you apply it and you use it for problem solving, it gets more attractive, right? It gets more of a, um, um, I mean, that's at least the experience I've had. If, 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 if it's put to use and, and if it's a, a a night, then it can be a nice experience. It doesn't have to be this um, dreadful thing. Um, how, how would you, um, you know, get people more interested in, in what math can do or, or how it improves your work? Yeah, I think you came to a good point there, which is like many times, at least like in school, when I grew up, like you having all of these issues that you need to solve in terms of uh, equations and things like that. And it's hard to think how you would actually apply it in real life and mm -hmm. how this would actually be any useful for you. But it's not until I came into 3D and especially then uh, rigging where you see the real world application of it. And the fact that you could have something like a, a node editor 
connect things up and mm -hmm. the fact that you can get instant results based on the equations that you make mm -hmm. it's it it makes the it makes the thing so much easier because you have this instant feedback you can see a re relationship between um, mm -hmm. between aspects that normally you would uh, you would you wouldn't um and nowadays like there's so many parts like Khan Academy where mm -hmm. you can have interactive um kind of classes understanding about matrix math etc which is also super scary i imagine if you're in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, but it's what 3d is based on so underneath everything mm -hmm. um it's just a matter of like how you how you apply it and, and most of the time like i'm trying to build tools and principles for me to for me not to deal with it on too much of okay. a daily basis because i'd rather do more fun stuff mm -hmm. uh, but when when it comes to those parts, then it's definitely a, a fact of like trying to like really dig into the into the issue of it and and understanding it on a it, it's easy to go online I find and trying to find an answer to mm -hmm. this is how this is how you do that but it's about why you do it mm -hmm. and I think that's the that's you, you I really need to fight with myself sometimes to mm -hmm. really try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, and to to get myself to understanding rather than just do as, as someone else tells you to, mm -hmm. because it gives you a, a better understanding of the issue and you can solve it, solve it on, an, on another level next mm -hmm. time. Okay, so it feels it feels more of a, a, a let's say a deeper understanding of the of the of the issue, right? Less less uh, superficial. Oh, I know how to solve it, but you really know un understand the problem at this point. Right? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That makes sense. Um, good. Uh, someone is typing. Rafi is typing. I have another question uh, here prepared for you. Um, what are the challenges of r real time rigs? The biggest challenges of real time rigging? <clears throat> the biggest challenges of real time rigs. Um, I think I haven't worked enough to encounter too much issues mm -hmm. is the short answer of it. Okay. But there is a lot of things that you can cheat in having uh, a lot of like dirty things that you can do with mm -hmm. meshes in something like Maya to solve issues that might not run so fast. Um, things like the the concept of uh, skinning. Uh, if you have something like, um, if you have a character, then uh, you apply skin skin weights. You call it to each of the each one of the parts. And um, if you have something like Maya, there's a lot of helpers and deformers that you can apply to be able to um, help you keep keep stuff like volume. So if you don't have muscles in it, mm -hmm. uh, you can still have a good uh, deformation on it without spending too much time. But in um, something like Unreal, at least for now, mm -hmm. uh, those things are expensive. So you can't. Re you need to. You need to do the dirty work of actually like painting stuff and making sure that it uh, deforms properly before it's heading to the to the engine to, um, okay. so, to calculate. So it's it. You can't cheat as much. Did I get that right, or is it? Or uh, it feels yeah, like I, you have to be. I, I, I'll t I'll say so. Okay. I'm sure. Yeah. It's like. Uh, but I think it comes down to like uh, limitations, probably in the um, mm -hmm. in the engine so far. But it's just gonna be a, a matter of time, I think, before all of this like things catch up. Because uh, if you look back in the last like ten years of Unreal Engine, mm -hmm. and um, you see the improvements that have been done, it's it's gonna be a very different situation in like five ten years from now. Okay, okay. for sure. So uh, Rafi has a question for you. Uh, not rigging related. Um, what are your predictions to options on home entertainment like Dream for LM, ML, MLF? Uh, fake. I was hmm. kind of a test run for a future adaption on virtual plays. I'm not sure if I, I haven't really understood everything of that, uh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm sure you do understand what she. Home entertainment, like dream for MLF. So yeah. the the dreams project that he, um, that this person is referring to is the one uh, oh, where okay. you had uh, the light. Um, 
is what I showed in the end, uh, oh, okay. where you have a, a mocap actor performing on a stage, and then they had a, a digital camera mm -hmm. happening, and then this was then streamed uh, live mm -hmm. to the to the audience. So a lot of it was in in my head at least towards digital, um, uh, like uh, like like theater, mm -hmm. and how this would be uh, encapsulated to uh, to bigger audience. Yeah, okay. there's a lot of possibilities on it because. If you imagine being, uh, and I'm not sure if that's entirely part of your question, but like having a stage uh, in a specific space with this audience that is viewing it from one perspective, mm -hmm. there is being at home, and I guess this goes into the whole like metaverse uh, mm -hmm. thing nowadays, but the fact that you could be anywhere in this space with a VR headset mm -hmm. is giving you opportunities to see the same story from different perspectives. Okay. And I think it might change our way of um, of storytelling mm -hmm. for the future in ways that you it's currently not possible from a one view like angle. Okay. Okay. Hope so that answers your questions. No, I think I'm I'm roughly Raphael will tell us if 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 it didn't. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure. Um, no, but so so you. I mean, that's a question I usually usually ask people when 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 they talk about meta. Um, I feel like a lot of what Zuckerberg talked about, and, and let's just put it that way, I, I don't think they necessarily want, they, they, they were happy to just talk about something else. Um, so, and, and I feel that's the reason why they talked about Meta in the first place. But it feels, for me, it feels like um, a, a lot of that presentation was not very exciting in terms of, um, or especially, maybe it's just because we work in the industry and we know um, of all these opportunities and possibilities and maybe the, the, the video is more directed towards people who don't know the industry and don't know the possibilities and the options but um, what what is it that you kind of missed in the presentation that you would think that's something to look forward to? Hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, I think the whole they need to might think a little bit about the concept of like what is the metaverse and what's make what's the difference with a video game just being a metaverse game um because there's a lot of companies now coming out and being like we're gonna take halo into the metaverse and make it a, a metaverse game but how like what's the what's the main constraints that would bring it into the same um same space um mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a big um, that's a big question. I think um, there's a lot of focus right now on um, on digital work mm -hmm. um, and being able to represent an office in um, in this digital environment. But I think there might be a step to dream a bit bigger, where you might not need to be all in the same space in an office that is representing uh, a real location mm -hmm. with real avatars. Mm -hmm. There might be other ways to to interact with people um, mm -hmm. that is not with these avatars that look exactly like you. Um, yeah, that's but yeah, a, we'll, we'll see. I mean, that's how I felt. I mean, especially about the set design of, of you know him being in in a nice beach house, which to me felt like <laughs> that's that's the most creative thing you can think of, like a house at the beach. I love um, when he shoots the avatar and it's like, should I be like this uh, dinosaur? Should I yeah. be this astronaut? Yeah. No, I got, I'm going to be exactly the same version of myself. Yeah, yeah. in a, in a, in a <laughs> black <3D>. hoodie <laughs> or in a black uh, <laughs> turtleneck. That's, that's, the, uh, yeah, that's the most creative thing I could come up with. Yeah, yeah, it felt like a little bit of a lost opportunity to me, this, this idea of, okay, well, I can be in a house on the beach, right? I mean, you could, you could, at least you could be a on the beach or, or somewhere mm -hmm. outside or in a, on, a, on a different planet or something like that. But no, he decides to go for, you know, the, um, to me, most, most boring. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they could have been better way to, to present that concept for sure. Yeah. But it's good though because it, it like for, for us in the like 3D and animation industry, I, I, I assume that this would generate a more work for us because you're having mm -hmm. this interest towards like 3D and animation uh, mm -hmm. and people want to be able to represent themselves. So there's a lot of um, companies nowadays which want to be the, the first into the space mm -hmm. uh, where you have things like um, 
like, like snapshot with the Bitmoji characters, uh, mm -hmm. going from a, like, this is your 2D avatar do you have into mm -hmm. now it's a 3D avatar. And this is the things that you could interact with. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of advancements that's going to happen. And it's interesting to follow to see um, see where it leads. Mm -hmm. And actually, like, what kind of fidelity would you want in this type of environments as well? Mm -hmm. Is it this cartoonish versions of the rigs? Or is it the more uh, realistic ones mm -hmm. that they showcased as well, where they had this more like, um, it looks more like a scan in a way? I'm mm -hmm. not sure the technology that they're using behind it, um, but it, lo it looks more realistic for sure. It's like yeah. you have a hard time to understand: is this actually yeah. video or is it yeah. is it 3D? Yeah. And I think we're kind of tapping into the. Um, I didn't mention too much in my presentation, but the whole uncanny valley, mm -hmm. where things started to to feel like something is off, even if it looks like correct, mm -hmm. there is something in your brain that tells you that there's something a bit wrong here. Yeah. Um, that leads me to another question, because um, I usually feel like um, your gut feeling in a lot of situations helps a lot with um, finding problems, especially when it comes to anatomy. And I'm talking about someone who draws a lot and, and, and has you know issues, of course, with ana anatomy in, 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 in a different field, but has you know understands how important it is to understand. Um, how, how important is it for you to like rely on your gut feeling in not necessarily understanding, but um, kind of noticing and, and realizing problems with the anatomy in, in terms of, you know, rewatching your own stuff or, or putting people into positions and, you know, I, I hope you know what I'm talking about. There's this, this yeah, moment where you're like, this is, to it. this is off, this mm -hmm. is not right. I don't know what it is yet, but I, I can mm -hmm. feel it. I can sense it, right? Oh, totally. Um, at Mainframe, I worked on this project for, um, uh, it was called Ultimate Me, and it had this digital people that was representing mm -hmm. uh, a version of themselves of how they could look like if they lost a lot of weight, I think. It's what I showed a lot of the screenshots of how mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. things could go wrong, the nightmare scenarios in 3D. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, but that was quite early in my career and looking back at it now like i can see so many red flags of things that i could improve or like things that was like horribly wrong mm -hmm. uh in terms of like defamations or whatever but yeah there's, there's definitely a gut feeling that builds up over time you're just doing it over and over again mm -hmm. where you see like this i should probably spend a bit more focus on on this particular area or this this kind of stuff is not not really relevant because you won't see it mm -hmm. um so I see a lot of people for um, uh, like like beginners at least where they make imagine a rig for this uh, for an anim a specific animation uh, and then you see the final thing and you realize that for example the character is only seen from the from the chest up mm -hmm. but the riggers have spent a lot of work on the whole the whole body uh, and then I tell them that you could have spent that time that you're doing the whole lower body that was never so uh, shown you could have spent it on the on the top instead. To have a way better deformations in your in your face, etc. So, and I think that comes into for you as a rigger, you need to ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. and be a bit annoying sometimes mm -hmm. to figure out like the constraints of the shot or the constraints of the character, uh, because ultimately, ultimately, like it's gonna fall down on you to to create this um, this realistic little puppet that can do as much or little as you as you wanted to. Cool. Um, here's another question from NGO. Any thoughts on the current status uh, trend for VR? I feel like it has been coming for two decades and it's still a niche. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't dabbled too much about VR. I don't even own a headset. I, I love to, to get into it. Uh, the few times I mm -hmm. tested it. Is, uh, is really impressive. But I think it goes back to our question a little bit in terms of the metaverse and like mm -hmm. how that is, is represented. Um, to have like a more immersive experience, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's adding a lot of value to whatever project you're working on. Mm -hmm. if, that's, um, if that's film, commercials, etc. Now the question comes, how do you apply it into context that is um, the fact that whatever content that is created mm -hmm. needs to be consumed with these devices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
that's that's kind of an issue right now because this devices need to come down in price before everyone can be able to enjoy it in the same way. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's good to see a lot of advancements from companies like Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, maybe potentially as well, mm -hmm. uh, where you could have then this real time environment uh, or game, whatever um, happening. Okay. But it's it's an it's a interesting space for sure. It feels like the, 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 the vast, just the sheer possibilities are, are so huge and so big that it, it feels like they don't really know what to use it for. Because what should you do for it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, which one, which one should we do first? Mm -hmm. yeah. I tried a really cool, um, uh, it was like a showcase, I think, for the, um, for the Vive, uh, which is including the portal characters, mm -hmm. uh, where you were like in one of those chambers, I think, um, and you were as a test subject. And I remember it's being very immersive, the fact that you uh, you had this whole room and then at some point I think the floor went down or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you, you could really like feel it in your stomach. Uh, oh, okay. and, and, and that thing is, is hard, to, hard to recreate. But um, uh, one aspect that I, I could actually see some use for it myself is to, like right now I'm sitting in front of a, a widescreen monitor here, but right. if, I, if I could have this view here, Mm -hmm. in a headset where I can actually, instead of having the character in Maya on a flat plane, it could actually be in 3D. That mm -hmm. would be so much more, more useful, I think. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really seen that so far, at least, in terms of what you could, uh, like using the computer in this VR things. It's more like, uh, like I mentioned myself, like experience, mm -hmm. or you're in a, like a video game or like this environment, but mm -hmm. there may be parts where we can take or work and bring it into that dimension as well. Mm -hmm. I think Christoph was writing a message. I'm not. So I, I just saw someone typing, but I'm not. Um, I yeah. scared him off. Oh no! no, no oh, there there, there we go. go. There we go. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on deep fakes uh, for rigging purposes? They lose the plastic plasticity uh, from a physical model but they seem to be quite decent and not as uncanny as the 3D models for mm -hmm. diggy doubles like Superman, uh, like Superman mustache. Superman mustache. Yeah. yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> That's mustache. Uh, yeah, it's, it, I think it comes back to what we talked about earlier where mm. like, I totally agree. Those results that you get from the, from the, from the deepfakes, as you might call mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah, you're able to create such a sometimes better fidelity than you could with a, with a freedom model. Mm -hmm. Now, there comes the limitations of you need to have a lot of data from the first place. Mm -hmm. You need the actor and uh, the subject that you're doing the deepfake from mm -hmm. to be kind of similar in terms of proportions. So mm -hmm. I think the reason why, um, why you're able to get it to look very good sometimes is because you have have those um, those constraints. Um, if you have someone like Nicolas Cage showing up in a lot of different uh, deepfakes, because you have so much material from mm -hmm. him that mm -hmm. you're able to get it together and build mm -hmm. like a massive data set. Okay. Um, but for for actors that might be un more unknown, or if if this to if this to go to like another level, mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to find a ways to take these data sets and um, like build better data from from less um, less real pictures, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also what I've heard, like talking to a lot of different artists from different fields, it usually at some point, it's not so much a matter of what technique do you use, but what result do you get? So whatever mm -hmm. works best um, is what you should go for and not, not necessarily stick to just one technique or one software one i don't know solution the, whatever the best solution is right? in in that particular moment is is actually i think what you should use and the more tools you have to your um to create whatever it is you want to create the better it is uh, at least that's yeah how I yeah think. definitely because if you look at the static pictures like i always love to see from this making of stuff like uh, Terminator or whatever you have nowadays mm -hmm. that is recreating this uh, digital characters, uh, especially from the past. 
they they show like picture like frame by frame this is how it looks the the real one from the mm -hmm. old one old mm -hmm. movies and this is our recreation recreation mm -hmm. and you can't tell the difference like they look exactly right. the same yeah but then when you see it in the movie and you're like there's something off and i you, like i said you can't really tell it what what it is yeah your gut feeling is telling you that something is wrong so i think that that's really where you you're getting the the benefits if this in this deep fakes mm -hmm. uh and I'm not entirely sure if we know what's what's making that distinction mm -hmm. uh, so much so much better than what you would get. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, just matching existing faces seem to create so much better the result than what we can get from um, creating digital humans over X amount of years. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, um, I think I'm looking at my. A crew for a time <laughs> restriction or something like that. We're good. Anything you want to pitch? Anything you want to advertise or um, promote? Or anything? Any advice you would love to give our audience as a kind of um, thing to think about for <laughs> for the future? Um. I would say like the point that I talked about um, in my presentation a bit in terms of coding and mm -hmm. uh, and learning how to code is quite important. And it's something that took me way longer than than I kind of hoped for. Like if I would have done it over again, I would have started way earlier in that. Because mm -hmm. it's a daunting subject and it's something that you might not um, see the benefit from in your workflow as it is. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's from like any position of your career in, in 3D, at least I would say, mm -hmm. it's so efficient, like it's, it's very important to, to know it, I think, in the way that your brain works and in the way that you're able to solve problems, because many times I would approach a problem one way, if I would do it manually, then if I would see these patterns of, oh, I don't need to do, I don't need to spend this four hours on making these things over and over. I can, I can much rather focus on this more interesting stuff. Um, and it was not until I started coding and like learning about um, these different scripting languages that I was able to push it through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, from, a, from being new, um, I understand that that's not a very fun advice in that way. <laughs> you just want me to tell you how, how yeah. to easily get a job at ILM or yeah. uh, mainframe or analog. Uh, but yeah, you got you got to start somewhere. Mm. Work on your work on your own portfolio. Make sure that you have some solid um, solid work going out. Work, work on things that you're passionate about. I think that's a really good thing to, that it comes down to. Don't really look at um, what's um, what's needed and like where the jobs are like look at what you really love to do because pushing into that subject is going to bring you so much more happiness and for you to be able to spend those extra hours on something that you really love thank yeah. you very very wise words uh, <laughs> in the end thank you so much um make sure to thank say you. thank you to nidia um once again for for her talk uh, it was great having you thanks for all the um, work you put into the talk and thanks again for you know um, making it uh, confessing to all these um, <laughs> things which um, I, um, I I'm not sure we, I think we talked before the before the actual um, uh, Q&A and, and, and I was mentioning how much you uh, took your took our topic to heart and, and, and confessed to so many things in your career um, thanks from NGO and Gristoff that people online are all typing thank you notes. Um, and, yeah, thank uh, you for all the good questions. Yeah, and uh, I hope you stick around a little longer on Discord. Maybe if people have more questions, mm -hmm. you just check in every once in a while if see if there's questions. Um, as I said, it would be great to you know write down the, the, the tips and resources uh, for our listeners. And um, we'll do. yeah. Um, with that, I wish everyone a good night and um, hope to see you back tomorrow. And uh, yeah, greetings to Porto. Thank you. Bye. Greetings.